That was our story we just sang, wasn't it? That was it. That was your story. That was mine. So, again, so good to be with you, and and, uh, welcome to our time together tonight. Uh, Before we begin, I I, want to acknowledge a few things. Uh, One is, I understand um, that collectively we have a a breadth and a a depth of, of study in Scripture. So, I want to acknowledge that, and, and I really, I deeply appreciate the fact that this is a Bible um, uh, studying church, and uh, we believe in the authority of God's word. And so, I, I just affirm that. I also want to affirm our denomination and their stance in, in as towards the the authority of God's word. And so, I um, I just want to recognize that first of all. And I also want us to think back. A question I had. What's your earliest memory of the Holy Scriptures? What's your earliest memory of the whole Holy Scripture? Anybody have one they'd like to share? Your earliest memory of the Holy Scriptures? Yes, Marcia? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you need to share your name and your favorite fruit. Yes, your favorite fruit. Okay, yeah. John 3.16, yeah. That's our story, isn't it? Any other earliest memories of Scripture? So preschool, yes. Yes, Hazel. Raspberries, favorite fruit. That's tremendous. Mother reading stories from the children's Bible, especially the Easter story. That's powerful. Yes. Yes. Oh. So you're going D, all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've learned uh, scripture. Some of us have learned scripture from the time we were very young. Uh, and what a, what a privilege it is to have that. I, I was the same way, you know, cold metal chairs in a cold church basement singing B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Uh, you know, the first song that maybe a lot of us uh, sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, so for me, some of my earliest memories are, are the stories, but certainly uh, the connection to the story through song. And so I recognize that, you know, as, as a church, uh, some of us might have a really, um, you know, long history with the Scripture, and that's wonderful and that's beautiful. And, um, but I also wanted to lean into our time and understand that our culture is changing. That our culture is changing. And so for, for people that were going to be reaching for Jesus and people that God's seeking after right now, I mean, the Holy Spirit right now is pursuing people in our community who have maybe very little, if any, Bible knowledge at all, are going to be coming into the community of our faith, and we're going to be given the task of discipling them. I mean, what a, what a beautiful privilege and honor it is to, to teach people, right? This is the Great Commission teaching them to obey all the things I've commanded you to do uh, at the end of the Great Commission. So one of the things that that we're going to be learning in our time, and this is something, a resource that uh, we hope is going to be helpful to people afterwards, so this is going to be recorded and and shared, is we're we're going to learn as we walk through the book of Philippians together, we're going to learn how to study the Bible. And so I understand I'm standing in front of pastors, and Sunday school teachers and all those. So that's a little intimidating, but I, I wanna let you know I'm really confident in what I'm sharing because ultimately each and every one of us, we, we are called to be students of God's word. And so I don't come to you today uh, as one who has uh, a PhD in New Testament. I just come to you as one who uh, is a student who wants to learn 
and who I, I've been poured into by important uh, people in my life uh, who've helped me study. And one of those actually is one that's going to give some influence to our time together, although he's not with us in flesh anymore. Dr. David Thompson from Asbury Theological Seminary was really influential in my life and how I studied scriptures. And actually, he was influential long before I got to know him as a professor. He was influential uh, even in his works that I read as a, as a young man. And, and that's one of the works we're going to be looking at tonight. This is, I've been, I've given copies of this away and they just keep finding their way back to me. New copies. Every time I come across one, I, I take it for myself and, and, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to give this away. And so if any of you are interested, uh, Dr. David Thompson has a little helpful book that is based off uh, Dr. Bob Trena, who was longtime English Bible professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, who really uh, was a, a, um, a jump starter in, in what we call inductive Bible study. And, and so this is a, a, um, a lay version of this. And so I just want to recognize Dr. Bob Trena and also Dr. David Thompson. And then uh, a few other uh, folks that have been influential, and I'll quote them, and, but I just want to give credit for, for the material tonight. Um, I also want to acknowledge Eugene Peterson, who is um, just such a wonderful teacher, and his approach to Scripture is so humble and so beautiful and so refreshing. And then also a little book that has made a big impact in my life is uh, Thomas Merton's Opening the Bible. And I'll be referencing that some tonight. But I just want to start our time together by asking a simple question. And that question is, what is Bible study? What is Bible study? You know, we come together sometimes in, in what we call Bible studies. And uh, we might go around, we might read, you know, we're, we're diving into the book of Philippians. So we might read three or four verses and we'll kind of hem and haw a little bit. And then somebody, typically the leader, will just ask the question, like, what does this scripture mean to you? What does this scripture mean to you? Uh, have you ever been a part of a Bible study like that? Yes. Okay. So, and, and people will go around the circle and, and we'll get different opinions. And it's always good to kind of hear how people read scripture differently. And then it's almost like at the end of that time together, we, we collectively try to weigh now, what does the scripture mean? What does the scripture mean? And just to be honest with you, sometimes that can be really frustrating. Um, because, um, you know, I don't know if you've heard this or not, there, there are, are as many interpretations of scripture as there are interpreters. <laughs> and so, um, it, I think this question, what is Bible study, is actually really important for us to answer. And so I'm just going to take a few minutes and uh, d dive into that. We're going to ask a series of questions tonight, and I hope, I hope that they really shape our time together uh, for the kingdom. Uh, Dr. Thompson says, Bible study is the regular, careful, systematic examination of the Holy Scriptures. Careful, regular, systematic examination of the Holy Scriptures with an alert mind and a prayerful and open heart. An alert mind and an open heart. And so just to start, you know, um, before we come to God's Word, there is this sense in which we're entering into something holy. So some of you have asked, why, why do you pray every time before you read the Scripture? Because I understand that when I'm reading the scripture, I'm reading something that has authority way beyond myself. That there is a weightiness to scripture that, that is, is way beyond anything I can bring to the table. Scripture, scripture is incredibly powerful. And so it's the sense that when we're talking Bible study in the proper sense, we want, to, we want to really take it seriously and approach it in such a way where, where we're trying to be learners, investigators of the Scripture. It's, it's almost like we become the detective and, and we're searching for clues throughout Scripture. 
And so Bible study is regular, careful, systematic examination of the Word of God with an alert and prayerful heart. Um, and he says, you know, worthwhile Bible study is going to require effort. And so uh, our time together will require uh, some effort. But I just want to tell you on the front end, you know, sometimes the word effort is, is a little bit intimidating for some people. This is going to be so worth it's so worth every ounce of effort you've put into it. I have never spent time in the scripture with effort at, at, at you know, being, being the driving force behind my time of, I, I really want to dig into scripture. I've never uh, studied scripture that way and stepped away from it and said, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. That just wasn't fruitful. I mean, scripture time and time and time again, just, just earlier, we were, we were talking about uh, how beautiful it is to study scripture and we see something new every time we open it up, right? Why is that? It's because God's word is living and active and it's powerful. And also we, we you know, every, every time we enter into the study of scripture, uh, we enter as, as those who, who don't know everything about God's word and we miss things. And so the repetitive reading of God's word is so, so important. And the second thing that Bible study is, what is Bible study? So it's the careful examination of the Holy Scriptures with an alert mind and with an open and prayerful heart. The second thing it is, is, and this might just seem really obvious to you, but write this down. Bible study is study of the Bible. Study of the Bible. And in a day and age... When we can go to any Bible bookstore, or we can go to Amazon, or we can go to ChristianBookDistributor.com, and we have in front of us a breadth and depth of resources of people that have already done the study for us, the real temptation is, I'm just going to piggyback on what they're doing, and I'm going to let them teach me, right? And, and there is a place for resources. We're going to talk about that. We're going to even talk about that at the end of our time together tonight, but but really, I just want to share that, that the careful examination of Scripture needs to be Scripture. And so the Bible itself, is, it should be what we're studying. Um, I, I made note, and by the way, this is just a quick caveat. Uh, someone, who here found out that uh, the Bible that I referenced in, in the morning service is at the library? Who helped me with that? Somebody said, I don't know who it was. Somebody sent me a message. Katie, it was you. It was Katie. Okay, you can get this at the public library through their app. You can get the electronic version of this, okay? This is just a helpful little, little book. I'm going to talk about it. It's a, it's a study Bible called uh, Cultural Backgrounds Study Bible. All right, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but that, that is available for free. Some of you have already ordered it. If you already ordered, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you paid $35 and you didn't need to, but uh, it was $60. Ooh, man. So, but uh, you can get that for free at the library, all right? But it is studying the Bible, and I, I just want to make a quick note here. Sometimes when we open Scripture, we put equal weight and authority to the words that are at the bottom of the page as those to the top. We do understand that even in, even in the good study Bibles, right, that those words on the bottom don't carry the same weight as those on the top. So I recommend when we're going to be studying God's word right out of the gates that, that we, we have a Bible that doesn't have any notes, all right? So like for Philippians, all right, I've started, when I start, when I start studying a book, what I do is I print off, I take a Bible that has no notes at the bottom and I, I Xerox copy it and I'll put it out in front of me on my desk. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight about how we begin to study a book of the Bible. But I don't want another person telling me how to read the text. I want to enter into Bible study as if, as if it's the first time I've ever approached the book of Philippians. And so that's how I've tried to enter into our time of Philippians together, is I try to look at the text like I've never seen it before. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. 
But we study the Bible. We don't study Bible notes, uh, although there's a place for notes. We don't study commentaries, although there's a place for commentaries. We start with the Holy Scripture. This is what the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, said. He said, I want to know one thing. I want to know the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself condescended to teach the way. For this very end, he came from heaven, and he hath written it down in a book Oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. I have it. And here is enough. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be homo unius libre, which means a man of one book. So it was, it was the passionate study of God. And by the way, John Wesley was passionate about the study of God's word, but biblical scholars today will look at Wesley's work and he'll say, they'll say, ooh, Wesley, that was, that was kind of a rough inter interpretation here or there. His heart was in the right place, but he was a learner of God's word. And so uh, all of us are on this journey. So the first question is, what is Bible study? And we've talked about it. It's that careful examination with a humble, prayerful heart. And then it's also study of the Bible and nothing other than the Bible, okay? The, the second question, the second question is, why study the Bible? So why study the Bible? Well, from a, from a secular viewpoint, um, one of the reasons why we would study the Bible is for intelligence. I mean, it is the greatest book in world literature. So uh, the Bible is studied by um, Christians, non-Christians alike, those who come from life from a, from a secular, maybe even atheist uh, viewpoint that the Bible is still studied for the sake of intelligence. But as those who approach the Scripture because we've been changed and, and we've sensed something happening that can't be explained in, in a secular sense, we, we sense that there's something living about, about the Bible. One of the reasons why we would study the Bible is because the Scriptures are the Holy Spirit's primary tool you might want to write this down the scriptures are the holy spirit's primary tool for the renovation of character and development of christian conscience so why study the bible well knowledge yes but through po proper study of the scripture god can change you the Holy Spirit can change your character. The Holy Spirit can change your perspective, your worldview, how you view reality around you. It is, it is a powerful tool. And this was uh, in Thomas Merton. He writes, uh, it's the Bible's nature. It's the very nature of the Bible to affront, to perplex, and to astonish the human mind. Hence, the reader who opens the Bible, listen to this, must be prepared for disorientation, for confusion, for incomprehension, and perhaps outrage. Did you all hear that? I'm going to read it one more time. The reader of the Bible, the reader who opens the Bible must be prepared. So get ready, it's coming. For what? For disorientation, meaning it's shaking your viewpoints. For confusion, meaning you can't comprehend exactly what's happening, and perhaps even outrage and anger. So uh, the reading of Scripture can cause you to get angry. Can I get an amen? <laughs> it can be incredibly frustrating. But this is what Jesus said you know, in John chapter 17. He's praying that prayer. He tells us that the Spirit will sanctify us. The Spirit will sanctify us through the teaching. And so as we read the Scriptures, we are sanctified by the truth. And it's the Spirit's work among us. Uh, Dr. Robert E. Coleman says, The Bible is not only the record of what God has done to disclose Himself and His salvation, 
but it's also the means by which the revelation is realized in our lives. And where it's properly understood and faithfully obeyed, it will in invariably bring to you him who is the way, the truth, and the life. So the scripture brings us to Jesus. It is the revelation of the living word, the one who is the word who became flesh. And so I want to talk just for a minute about one of the Bible's main objectives. And, and this is true. One of, one of God's main objectives, why the Bible? Why the Bible? Why did God um, want to reveal himself through Holy Scripture? I think that's a good question to ask. And I think maybe the clearest answer to that is that he wants to communicate to us. He wants to speak our dialect. He wants us to get it. And I, I, I think even when you think about how the scriptures, how we have original language and how we can study original language in the scriptures, and you think about, okay, in the Old Testament, he spoke... We have, we, have, uh, we have Hebrew, we have Hebrew texts that we can study in the Old Testament. And then we find, you know, the, the Aramaic. And then, and then in the New Testament, although Jesus uh, does, we have some Aramaic text in the New Testament with Jesus. Uh, by and large, it's Greek. And it's not just Greek, it's Koine Greek. And Koine means common Greek. And I think there's something to that, to think, okay, he, he didn't want to encode everything about the scripture to make it so that common people couldn't understand. He wanted it to be communicated clearly to folks that he spoke common language. Isn't that wonderful? That, that God wants to reveal himself to us and uh, it's, it's through our own dialect that he speaks to us. So uh, the question that is asked, and Dr. Thompson asked this, you know, why, why should we study the Bible in our own dialect? And I, I'm going to talk a little bit about versions of the Bible. I think that's important for us to consider in our time together. Uh, some people um, uh, really struggle on this point of they want to make sure they're using a Bible that carries weight and authority and um, you know, there's some portion. I don't want to make light of anyone. Uh, if you have if you have viewpoints that I'm challenging, um, please take it with a grain of salt, and I'd be happy to communicate with you. But even like King James Version, I mean, it's 410 years old. It's 410 years old. All right, and I don't think God speaks in these and thous to us today. I I, I think He wants us to get it. And so people that are going to be coming into the life of our church, and, and, and God wants them to fall in love with him, and he wants people to become students of his word, I don't think God's going to act them, ask them to change their dialect. Ma language, maybe. <laughs> language, maybe. Uh, I'm not going to tell you a story. It'll take too long. But, but dialect, he's going to speak to us in a way that we can understand. And so why study the Bible in our own dialect? I think that's a question when we talk about why study the Bible. We should ask, well, why in our own dialect? And this is really, I've already kind of jumped ahead of myself here, but this is really important for us to understand. The first reason is because we want to know that God takes communication seriously. I mean, this is, Revelation is, and I'm not talking about the book of Revelation, I'm talking about the act of God breaking through, a supernatural God breaking through in space and time in, in Holy Scripture. Why should, we, why should we talk about dialect? Because it tells us that God takes communication seriously. He wants, he's on a mission, and this is part of his mission, to reframe us through, through a revelation through Holy Scriptures. And so the first reason, why in our own dialect? Because one, God takes it seriously. And two, why in our own dialect? Because this communicates that the community of God takes mission seriously.
So why is it important for us to think about Scripture, not just in the sense of, of a knowledge to be attained, although there certainly is that, but why should we take, think about, okay, how do, we, how do we take our own dialect and now communicate to the community that we're part of, all because we know that God takes communication seriously and God has put us on a mission and, and God's people should be serious about the mission. And so reading the scripture in our own dialect is important because it helps us communicate. And then the last reason why I think it's really important for our own dialect is because this is the way that God communicates to us, to you. God's word will change your life. It will change your life. Um, it has the power to do that. I'm going to share a story that, that actually is a bad example of what I'm talking about, but it's also a good example of what I'm talking about. I, I was, um, man, I was, I was praying and I felt like I wasn't getting through, to, through the ceiling of my house. And um, I had a time of scripture and it was just like, it just wasn't, it just wasn't happening. You ever been there? It was just a mess. And um, I just felt, I felt like I failed in my devotional time. And so I leave my room and I hit, I hit the front door and I felt like, I felt like God said, Mark 1.11. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know how. I mean, it's just like that came into my head. So I turn around and my Bible's still on my bed and I get back down on my knees beside the bed. I turn to Mark 111 and while I was turning, I'm like, okay, Mark, the beginning of Mark, I'm, I'm going off of what I know, right? Beginning of Mark, what's going on? Ah, there's not a lot there. And I turn at 111, you are my son in whom I well, I'm well pleased. And I said, God, that, that's about Jesus. And then I was reminded of Hebrews. When, when God himself used the suffering of his son to bring many sons and daughters into glory, and he said, it was for my son, and it's for you now. It, it changed me. That, that moment was transformational in my life. It was one of the moments when I really became confident. I mean, I, I had been a pastor for, for seven years at that point, but at that point, I really became confident that I didn't have to please God in my devotional life. He loved me. He loved me. And, and devotions are still important. We'll talk about there's different reading of Scripture. There is a devotional reading of Scripture. But God's communication with you is in our own dialect. He wants, he wants you to know how much He loves you. He wants you to know what He's like. He wants you to know Him. He doesn't just want you to have knowledge. He wants you to have a personal knowledge of him, his kingdom, and his ways. And so there are multiple translations, okay? There are multiple translations from very literal translations to translations that are almost like what we'd call paraphrase, meaning they're very interpretive. A scholar has come along and he's tried to put as best as we can in our own dialect. I would recommend using multiple translations for Bible study. I got this out of our, I just brought it down from the library actually, but this is like a parallel Bible. And so this, this Bible itself is gonna put four translations side by side, New King James, Eng, English Standard Version, New Living Translation, and the Message are gonna be all four side by side on every page. So you could read multiple translations of scripture. I recommend that. If you do not know uh, Greek or Hebrew, I would recommend getting as many translations of scripture as you can and, and begin to, to see the differences between the different translations. It's, it's a wonderful gift. It's a wonderful tool. Sometimes reading something more literal can be helpful. I, I would say, especially when we're doing the serious scripture, having something that's either middle of the road or a little more literal. If you want to know kind of where they are on a scale, there, there are places you can look for that. You can ask me. I can give some of my opinions on that. But, of course, NIV is probably middle of the road. It's not as literal as some of the translations. Some of the good translations that are more literal, I think, are like an NRSV. It's a little more literal. Um, some of the translation, a translation that would be a little looser than, say, NIV, a little more paraphrased, would be like New Living Translation. Eugene Peterson's The Message 
uh, is, is probably in a league of its own. <laughs> Uh, but it's beautiful and it's wonderful and, and, and it communicates for some people in their own dialect. But ultimately, this critical examination interpretation of the text, which is what we call exegesis. So if you ever hear me say the word exegesis, exegesis is a critical examination interpretation of the Word of God. Eugene Peter says, Peterson says, ultimately, exegesis is not about mastering the text. So let's just settle that straight right now. There isn't a one of us that's going to master it. The breadth and depth of the study of God's Word goes far beyond anything we can internalize or, or, or memorize or, you know, we, can spend, we, could, we could spend ourselves for nothing other than God's Word the rest of our lives and you could spend every hour of every waking moment and you're still not going to come close. Just be honest. It, it's that amazing of a book, but it's still worth our effort. Peterson says, uh, exegesis is not mastering the text, but it's submitting to it as it's given to us. So this isn't about mastery of the Bible. This is about learning how to submit to God's word. Isn't that beautiful? So um, a, couple, a couple basic questions. When we begin to study the Bible, there are a couple basic questions we need to ask, all right? And I'm going to make room. I, I didn't know. I didn't know how many people were going to be here. And so uh, we have folks way in the back, and I want them to be able to read what's going on up here. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Um, I, have, I have notes, printed notes. Oh, this is just, look at that. Look at that. Oh, my Lanta. I mean, it just looks like somebody changed the oil of the car and just put it all over the whiteboard here, doesn't it? Oh, I got this one out of a closet. It might go back in that closet. Okay, so two, two questions we're going to ask here. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to go really big, okay? I'm going to go really big on this. Uh, the first question, before we study the Bible, okay, so we know what Bible study is. I've tried to give us a little bit of insight on, okay, here's some different uh, uh, versions of the Bible we can have. But the first question we really want to ask is, what did, it's bad, I know. The original author intend to say. So that, that really does need to be, how bad is it? That's pretty bad. What did the original author intend to say? So that really does need to be, uh, it's stuck. Our uh, first question. Um, and and th this should be where it starts every time. Th this, is, this is the batter's box of Bible study. So before you get out of the batter's box, uh, this, this is the way to first base, asking the question, what did the original author intend to say? And there is a road. This is not hopeless, okay? Um, this is not hopeless. And my prayer is that as, as we, uh, as a community, oh, look at Kurt, bless your heart. As a community, as we uh, dive in, oh, a little glass cleaner. All right. I use 90% I use rubbing alcohol. Look at that. Let's give Kurt Beard a hand, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you, Hillary. You were gonna do it too? Okay. Boy, that was, that was a mess. What did the original author intend to say? My prayer is that, the, 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 let, let me just cast a little vision for a minute, okay? When praying for our time together, this is what I pictured. I pictured somebody 
who was, um, had deep appreciation for the Bible and loved learning from other people, but their Bible study had always been from the hands of someone else. They, they had always been down the road of interpretation. They were always eating the fruit that someone else was giving them. And, and my vision, and as I prayed into our time together, I, I pictured someone stepping into the batter's box and getting their first base hit. I mean, you think about, I, I love going to kids' baseball games, and, and I love it. One of my favorite things about youth baseball, and I see this every single year that my sons have played, there's always that kid who, who hasn't gotten a hit all year. And everybody knows it. And every time they strike out, they drag their bat, and it's the same old stuff, and the coach is telling the same thing. Elbow up! Keep your eye on the ball! I mean, how many times are those words said at youth baseball fields? Come on. I mean, it's like, guys, it's not working. We, we're going to need to do something else, aren't we? So usually it takes intentional investment on a coach's part of, of finding a kid that hasn't gotten a hit all year, and just doing repetition, all of a sudden, in a batter's box, something will click. And he'll start hitting the ball, or she'll start hitting the ball. And it's like, it, they begin to get confidence in the next time, the next game, maybe they might come close and get a foul ball, they're still nervous, they kind of go back to their old habits, but the next thing you know, you know, two or three games down the road, all of a sudden they're getting hits, and then all of a sudden they're getting on base. And, and they're, they're, they're a different player. And my vision for this was that, People who, who had always been relying on someone else would begin to have study habits. That's what this is about. And would begin to have this burning fire on the inside of them for God's holy word. That they would become investigators and, and, and they would just say, I'm going to search the scriptures till something changes in my life. And I'm going to search the scriptures until, until something shifts. And I'm going to search. And, and they become, get this, they, they become so confident, not in, not in their understanding of scripture, but confident because they've seen God meet them in their scripture. And they, it's like everything's coming alive. It's like stuff's coming off the page that they want to start a Bible study with their neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. I, I think God can give each of us that confidence. Not confidence in ourselves, but confidence that God's word is enough. And if we take it seriously, that God would do a great, great work. And so the question we ask first way out of the batter's box is what did the original author intend to say? Um, it's important for us to know that that part of this question is knowing that the Bible is historical. It is historical. And, and I don't want to get into too much textual criticism here, but there is, there is no doubt this is, that this is historical. You know, from the Bronze era, about 1500 BC, all the way to the Romans, about 100 AD. So it is historical, and it's important for us to know that. Uh, David Thompson says, the Bible was written first. I love this. Listen to this. The Bible was written first to those particular people with the Holy Spirit knowing, get this, that you and I would be reading over their shoulder. I love that. I love that. Did you hear that? The Bible was written to these historical folks first, knowing that we would be reading over their shoulders, that we would be, be tuning in what, what is being said to these people, what is God saying to these people, that that, that, that would be our first drive is, is really getting to the root. And, and I want to be honest, sometimes it's easy not to do this. And you know why 
We don't do that because it's easy. <laughs> we go the easy way in scripture reading sometimes, don't we? And I think all of us have been guilty that we come something that, I don't know, I'll just go to something I know, you know? We, we tend to go back, and there is purpose, I think, in Philippians, why the Lord's led us here, because as we're gonna, as we're gonna lean into in just a minute, you know, a lot of us have, have uh, favorite verses that are in Philippians. I know that. But some of you have already told me. And I knew that coming in. And, and what I'd like us to experience together is for God to paint the picture of what he was saying to, to these churches in Philippi and that your verse would become more meaningful to you, that there would be a depth to it and there would be an understanding to it. You see it? So the first thing we need to know is that it, it, it is historical. And, and the second thing we really, we, we need to wrestle with is that um, there is an objective, there is an objective nature to scripture. Um, so when we do the Bible study where we say, what, is, what does this mean to everybody? We're making it a, a subjective nature. So it means, it means whatever the person who's reading it says it means. And I think part of, of going back to this, what did the original in, author intend to say, is to understand that there, there is an objective meaning to Scripture. God had a purpose slash purposes in inspiring this text. And so to, to be able to say, all right, there, there is something this isn't about just what does it mean to me. There is something the Holy Spirit is doing. There's something behind this text. And sometimes that carries more weight than others. And it's important for us to be honest and have uh, integrity in our interpretation of the scripture. But that, that's one of the, um, we, just, we just need to look and see what is actually there. That's how we have an objective nature, learning an objective nature of the Bible. We begin to look and see what's actually there. I want to talk just a minute, you know, the, the, the struggle, the struggle is going to be this. Actually, it's already been, we've already had the perfect example, okay? What we had was we had Pastor Adam trying to erase a board with rubbing alcohol, and all of it made was a big mess, okay? This is, I talked to Pastor Caleb earlier because he was in here, and I was, I was scrubbing on this board because it, it was, it, it had a lot of history to it, okay? But when we read the scripture, th this board is a pretty good example. Because when you read the scripture, you're going to see stuff. And even if you have a Bible that you've had for 80 years, or maybe it's your dad's Bible, some of you have made notes in the margins, and you've underlined things, and you've highlighted things. All of that terrific. All of that's great. But I would suggest that if, if we want to answer this question, that we try to approach the Bible as plainly as we can and we go through and we erase all of our notes and all of our preconceived notions, all of our former study. So I, I try to surrender my former study. So the things I know about Philippians, I, I, I've, I've taken a course on Philippians. And so as I approach this again, I'm like, okay, God just... Teach me again. And, and, and we start at the very basic. We're going to talk next week about how to study, how to study in units and ways that we can kind of see the flow of the letter. And I think it's going to be really, really beneficial to you. But even, even in this again, I'm asking, all right, who is Paul? Who is Paul? Who is he? And I'll begin to go to, through Philippians and I'll see how Paul describes himself. We talked about that on Sunday, right? He is a servant. He is a slave. But he has even greater description as we go through Philippians. So asking questions that we just assume we know the answers to, to can be one of the most beneficial things we do in Scripture. So approach it like we've never approached it before. This is critical and key not only for you, but for every person that comes through that back door. Can I, can I say that this is the way of missional Bible study in a church? 
Because when we approach the text this way, when we start asking questions that we think we already know the answers to, but we, we surrender ourselves, we submit ourselves again, even to the tiniest, tiniest detail of the text, and we say, I want this to form me in a new way. I want to learn something new. I don't want to look and overlook one dot or iota of this. I want God to speak to me. Then every person that comes through our doors feels like, oh, they're asking questions that I want to know the answer to. Who is Paul? Who are the Philippians? There was a uh, video sent. It might make its way. It might make its way to, uh, to the Sunday morning at some point, but maybe a particular child was impersonating me after church on Sunday. And they said, open your Bibles to the book of Philippines. I, I want to be serious here because a lot of damage can be done. A lot of damage can be done around the study of God's word. My, my wife was converted when she was 16 years old and, and um, don't joke with her about this. She takes it fine. She takes joking really well. But I'm going to use her as an example. She, she was converted. She grew up in church, um, had a knowledge of, of God, but, but was radically converted when she was 16 at a camp ministry. And uh, very next Sunday, she came back uh, to her community, and she was inserted into a youth group, Southside Christian Church. Pastor Tim Thompson was the, was the children's pastor, or not children's pastor, he was the worship pastor there. And so I've known Tim and known of Tim for a long time, and, and I'm so glad I get to serve in the community with him. But Lauren came back, and uh, she had just been saved. She had just gotten baptized. And I'll never forget, they, they asked her to read um, a scripture and so every, every kid in the youth group had a different scripture to read, and they just handed them out and pieces of paper, and it came time for her to read hers. And you're, you're, the process was you, you were to look up the scripture, which was, you know, there's an index in the front. So she was able to do that. She wasn't real familiar with the Bible. But you had to read what verse you were reading and, and then read it, read the text. So she stands up and she says, I'll be reading from the book of Malachi. And the whole youth group just erupted. And she was asked to read from the book of Malachi. Now, don't joke, don't, don't tease her about that. But she had, she had no idea. And a church can respond in a couple different ways, can't we? We can say, were you born in a barn? Malachi, it's Malachi. She still has youth group members that tease her about this to this day. Or we can say, isn't it beautiful to be around people who want to read the scripture and they just don't, they just don't know. They, they've never. I mean, God's word is an invitation. And so when we begin to ask elementary questions, not only will, will we grow in our understanding of the text, but it puts us all on a level playing field and it invites people. We begin asking questions that really maybe some of us have always wanted to ask and yet we felt too dumb to ask them. And, and the spirit, spirit begins to move in wonderful ways. So we ask, who is Paul? And all of a sudden we can tell the story of Paul's conversion. How wonderful. We, we can tell all of the things, even from the book of Philippians, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, all the things he's laying down so that so that he could be a prisoner? I mean, it's beautiful. And so we just want to begin to just ask how, how God uh, would form us as we begin to just look at this objective nature of Scripture. Uh, and this is how, um, yeah, I already said that. This is how the Bible study creates an invitation to others. So, And, and then another thing we want to ask here. Uh, when it comes to what did the original author intend to say is, is recognizing that there is authority. We've already hinted at this. Uh, there is authority to God's word 
that's well beyond ourselves. And, and honestly, this scares the daylights out of me. Every Sunday, every Sunday there is a weight to, to what I feel like I'm doing. And I don't want to mess this up. Because, because of, of the authority of the Holy Scriptures, and I'm not just talking about preaching here, I'm talking about how I handle the, the Scriptures. If I, if I do them carefully, if I weigh them carefully, there is an authority to, to God's Word that's well beyond anything that is, that is, that is found within ourselves uh, by nature. God's Word carries a weight to it and, and because of that, we cannot approach the text with pride. We cannot approach the text with pride. We can't read ourselves. And the temptation is this, that we assume that the author's intent is what we interpret the intent to be. You tracking with me here? We... We can just assume, if we don't humbly approach the text, we can just assume that the original intention, oh yeah, I know what that means. Do you? Do you really? And, and so I want to approach the text humbly. And, and part of that is, is a posture. You know, if I could say what would describe the posture of reading Scripture, it would be being prone before God with our hands out in front of Him. And just saying, I am here to learn. I am at your feet. Teach me. Give me wisdom in how to handle these scriptures. Coming before him humbly it is, is one of the most formative things we can do in our scripture reading. And so the authority of scripture stands independently from myself. Uh, Karl Barth said, uh, when you begin questioning the book of the Bible, like what did the original author intend to say? you find that the Bible, I love this, is questioning you. When you ask, what is this book? You find that you are also implicitly being asked, who is it that reads this book? Y'all get that? That when we begin to honestly begin to ask this, we find that there is a, a living aspect to the word when we humbly approach it that is challenging us, uh, much like what we read uh, Thomas Merton saying. It's, it's leading us to that place of sometimes even frustration and confusion and disorientation. And, and, but ultimately, the text is asking, who are you? Who is the reader? Are you shaped into this? The text continually to ch challenges us, and the way to that point is asking that question, uh, understanding the authority of God's word. What does the original author intend to say? And so the last, the last thing that we need to weigh here when we think about um, the authority of God's word and the author's original intention Is, is not only understanding that there was purpose for a time and a place of, of God revealing himself uh, to a people. Um, you know, most certainly this is true, but one of, the, one of the real struggles here is even coming through and saying, this, okay, I'm speaking, whoa, a little supper there. I'm speaking as a Wesleyan. I have been formed as a Wesleyan Methodist thinker. It has, it has informed me. My tradition and my theological tradition has informed me and it has formed the way I read Scripture. I anticipate being a Wesleyan and Methodist the rest of my life. But I am not being, I am not being, okay? I am not being true to the author's original intention if I don't have theological wrestling even in my own life. So that word chosen. I mean, I've done a lot of study on that word. And if I were to study again, I would try to start from scratch. What does that mean? And I, I have come to an interpretation 
of what Paul means by chosen ones. But, but that doesn't mean I didn't want to know. And I didn't want to just say, oh, yeah, I already know this. We've talked about it in theology class. I know what tulip means. And so weighing your author's original intention even means that you, you set aside you set aside things that, that could become barriers in your interpretation of Scripture by you just saying, I already know this. I, I've, already, I've already studied this. I know what this is about. And we just have crutches sometimes that we stand on, don't we, independently from Scripture. Search the Scripture. Allow the Scripture to speak to you. And you won't have to set up crutches for your theological positions. If you find in right study, and that's what, what has led our tradition to where it is, right? And so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. But what we want to do is create a context where we're asking honest questions so scriptures can be weighed with, with author's original intent, with the authority of God's word, with approaching it with an objective nature and understanding that it's historical so that we, we could be honest in our interpretation of it, that we're not relying just on somebody to tell us how to treat the text. We can become students of our, of our own. And you might say, well, that might be... Uh, that might be really dangerous. It can be. And this is where I would say uh, it's important to have good resources. Uh, good resources can be uh, incredibly uh, um, valuable. All right, I'm going to talk about resources just for a minute. I already talked about this. So the Cultural Study Bible, what this is going to do, all right, I want to talk just for a minute. This is just a helpful, re it is not, it is not, let me tell you, it is not comprehensive. Not even close. It is helpful for daily study for those kinds of people that just, you know, I, I want to get used to this, Pastor. I, I have questions. I want to start asking questions about what I'm reading. And so are there notes in the bottom of this? Yes, there are notes, but they are not interpretive. They are not interpretive notes. They take words and they'll do a word study on a word or they'll tell you, hey, this is what a shekel means. I mean, it, it, it's really, really helpful stuff. Uh, they, they, it does great things with geography and being able to understand, you know, even like Paul's missionary journeys. How far is this? How, how important is Philippians to Romans? This, uh, it's been a while since I've looked, but I, I think that even that would, would help e even on our book of Philippians. I haven't gone through, I confess that I haven't gone through all of the notes on Philippians found in that, but I, I'm confident if I remember from the past, it's helpful, all right? So to be able to, to wrestle with all of these things, anybody need that up still? And then the last question we ask, okay, I'm gonna erase these bottom, kind of these little notes here that help us understand the, the important one, and that is, what's the author's in, intent? After asking that, so that's the first question, all right? There are only two questions. What's the author's original intent? And how is the Holy Spirit, you know, inviting us to look over the shoulder of the author? And the second question is, what, if anything, does this text mean? us. And, and the little, if anything, is, um, it's important for us to, I think those are actually important words, because um, not, not all of the text, I think, the interpretation, let me put it this way, uh, all of the text that we study, not every interpretation is going to be like light bulbs and butterflies. I mean, not all of it's just going to set us, you know, like this, this is going to change the world. Don't take that out of context. I'm not saying the Word of God doesn't change things. It does. But, but we can't just go to, uh, you know, flip the Bible to a random page and, and then say, okay, this is, this is going to change me today without having, you know, this understanding what the author is really saying, but also understanding that in, in every scripture, the, the interpretation might have a different weight for where we are in life and, and for the culture as a whole. 
So I think it's important for us to understand that not all Scripture relates in the same way. Okay, that's a better way of saying it. And then uh, this also communicates what, if anything, does the text mean for me that knowledge is not enough. Knowledge of Scripture is not enough. There has to be a place where the power of Scripture meets our everyday lives and the culture around us. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It, ha- it happens through the study of God's Word. And we, ha- we have to know that when we ask uh, not only the first question, what did the original author intend to say, that God's going to bring the knowledge that we gain from that study into the present, and it's going to change stuff. It's going to change your opinion about things. It's going to challenge you. It's going to frustrate you. But the call of Scripture is always obedience. It's always obedience. Are we going to obey? And that's the question that Scripture uh, asks. And, and uh, going back to Peterson, who says, this is not about mastery. This is about submission. And so, okay, uh, any questions about anything we, we've, I've shared so far? Anything you need clarification on? Sounds like the kids are having fun. Any questions? You guys want to know what the homework is? It's going to be really fun. Okay, I'm going to uh, do something here for, our, for the end of our time together. Uh, and before I do that, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to share what the homework is for next week, all right? This is, this is what I want us to do. I want us to uh, do two things. One is I want you to read uh, the book of Philippians in one sitting. I want you to read the book of Philippians in one sitting. If you do this as a couple, uh, maybe one of you read it and the other one listen. Because the second challenge is that uh, not only do you read the book of Philippians in one sitting, but I want everyone to listen. I want you to listen to a reading of the book of Philippians in one sitting. And, and you can do this a variety of ways. Maybe some of you have Bible on tape. Uh, YouTube, uh, if you go to YouTube, if you access the internet, YouTube, there, I mean, there's so many translations of the Bible and you can hear them being read um, and very, very important. But this is how we start, okay? To begin to answer the question, what did the original author intend to say? We're, we're leaning into next week right now. We're, we're going to learn how you start and you start by simply reading the text. I... I read aloud. My best reading is when I read aloud, if I'm not listening. I'm an auditory learner. I, I don't, I, don't I, I remember things that way, okay? So even, um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So, but learning to, to uh, begin to study God's word uh, involves not only reading, but I think, especially in cultures prior to ours, most certainly, uh, biblical, biblically, uh, hearing God's word was a, a main source of, of acquiring knowledge and transformation through God's word. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to read a version of Philippians. I doubt, I doubt there isn't a single person here that's ever heard Philippians in this version. This is not only the message, okay? So on the, on the literal to paraphrase version, so literal as in that went through the Greek and translates word for word. Sometimes it's really rough and isn't very readable. To paraphrase where you read a whole sentence in the Greek, and, and Peterson was a scholar, an incredible scholar. But his, his purpose, when we talked about dialect, his purpose was, I want the Word of God to be accessible. He wants it to be accessible to even kids that are, you know, teenagers. And, and, and so this is called the message remix. <laughs> But before we read it, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. So, Lord, we just give you our time. We give you our minds and our hearts, and we acknowledge that uh, you're here. And we just ask you to help us. Help us as we hear your word today. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In closing, hear the word of the Lord. Paul and Timothy, uh, both of us committed servants of Jesus Christ, write this letter to all the followers of Jesus in Philippi, to pastors and ministers included. And we greet you with the grace and peace that comes from God the Father and our Master Jesus Christ. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. And each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart, and I'm so pleased that you've continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up into the present. Now, there's never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God, who started this great work in you, would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the day of Jesus Christ. And it's not all fanciful to me to think of you this way, for my prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put into trial, and came out of it in one piece. All along, you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love and miss you these days. Sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, that your love would flourish and that you will not only love much but well, that you would learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary. A life Jesus would be proud of, bountiful in fruits of the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. I want to report to you, friends, that my imprisonment here has had the opposite intended effect. Instead of being squelched, no, the message has actually prospered. All the soldiers here and everyone else, too, found out that I'm in jail because of this Messiah. That piqued their curiosity. And now they've learned all about him. Not only that, but most of the followers of Jesus here have become far more sure of themselves in the faith than ever, speaking fearlessly about God, about the Messiah. And it's true here, yes, that some preach Christ with me out of the way. They think that they'll step right into the spotlight, but others do it with the best heart in the world. And one group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I'm here defending the message, wanting to help. The others, now that I'm out of the picture, they're merely greedy, hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Their motives are bad. They see me as competition. And so the worse it goes for me, the better they think for them. So how do I respond to that? I've decided that I really don't care about their motives, whether mixed or bad or indifferent. Every time one of them opens their mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I cheer them on. And I'm going to keep that celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Through their faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, He wants everything. He, he, he wants to do and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the one least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only makes me make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or I die. They didn't shut me up. They've given me a pulpit. Alive, I'm Christ's messenger. Dead, I'm in his bounty. Life versus even more life. I can't lose. As long as I'm alive in this body, there is good work for me to do. And if I had to choose right now, eh, I hardly know which I'd choose. It's a hard choice. The desire is to break camp here and be with Christ. That's powerful. And some days I think nothing better. But some days, because of what you're going through, I'm sure it's better for me to stick it out here. So I plan to be around for a while companion to you as your growth and joy in this life of trusting Jesus continues. You can start looking forward to a great union when I come to visit you again. We'll be praising Christ, enjoying each other. Meanwhile, please live in such a way that you are a credit to the messenger of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on 
whether I come or not. You can, your conduct must be the same whether I show up in these things for myself or I hear of it from a distance. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they're up against. Defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. There's far more to this life than trusting in Christ. There's also suffering for Him. And the suffering is as much as a gift as the trusting. You're involved in the same kind of struggle you saw me go through, on which you are now getting an update report in this letter. If you've gotten anything at all of following Christ, if His love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, please do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of the status no matter what. No, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim any special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that crucifixion. And because of that obedience, God has lifted him high and honored him far beyond anything or anyone or ever that could ever be so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this humble Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. But now that I've separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you, God himself willing and working that will give him the most pleasure. Do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering. No. No second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air, and in this squalid and polluted society, provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light giving message into the night so I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be proof that I didn't go through all of this work for nothing. Even if I'm executed here, friends, I'll rejoice in being an element of the offering of your faith that will make you, that, that you will make on Christ's altar a part of your rejoicing. But turn about fair play. You must join me in my rejoicing. Whatever you do, don't feel sorry for me. I plan to send Timothy to be with you very soon, and he can bring back all of the news of you that he can gather. Oh, how that will do my heart good. I have no one quite like Timothy. He is so loyal and genuinely concerned for you. Most people around here are looking out for themselves with little concern of the things of Jesus. But you know for yourselves that Timothy's the real deal. He's been devoted, he's been a devoted son to me, and together we've delivered the message. And as soon as, as soon as I see how things are going to fall out for me here, I plan to send him off. And then I'll hope and pray to be right on his heels. But for now, I'm dispatching Epaphroditus, a good friend and companion in my work. You send him out to help me, and I'm sending him back to help you out. He has been wanting in the worst way to get back to you, especially since recovering from the illness you've heard about. He's been wanting to get back and reassure you he's just fine. Huh. 
He nearly died, you know, but God had mercy on him. And, and not only in him, he had mercy on me too. His death would have been one huge pile of grief on top of the other. So you can see why I'm so delighted to send him on to you. When you see him again, hale and hearty, how you'll rejoice and how relieved you'll be. Give him a grand welcome, a joyful embrace. People like him deserve the best you can give. Remember the ministry to me with, that you started but weren't able to complete? Well, in the process of finishing up that work, he puts his life on the line and nearly died for it. And that's about it, friends. I'd be glad in God. I, I don't mind repeating what I've written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. I guess better safe than sorry. So steer it go. here it goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs, those religious busybodies, all bark and no bite. All they're interested in is appearance. Knife happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at in this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and, and we know it, even though we can't list what many think are impressive credentials, even though we can list what many think are impressive credentials. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. But those very credentials, these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing them up and I'm throwing them in the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ, yes. All these things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Jesus Christ as my Savior firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. It is dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I couldn't get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave it all up, that inferior stuff, so I could know Christ personally, experience His resurrection power, be a partner in His suffering, and go all the way with Him to His death. If there was any way to get on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. And I'm not saying I have it all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way. I, I'm reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I have got an eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. And I'm off, I'm running, and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. goal. Those, who, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something else, then total commitment. God will clear your blurred vision and you'll see it yet. Now that we're on track, let's stay on it. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those who are running the same course, headed for the same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get to you all along with them. I warned you, I warned you of them many times, sadly, and I'm, I'm having to do it again. All they want is Easy Street. They hate Christ's cross, but Easy Street is dead end street. And those who live there make their bellies their gods, belches their praise, and all they can think of is their appetites. But there's far more life for us. We're citizens of heaven high. We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. He will make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he's putting everything as it should be under and around him. My dear friends, dear friends, I love you so much. I do what is very best for you. You make me feel so much joy. Fill me with so much pride. Don't waver. Stay on track. Stay steady with God. I urge Eodia and Synthica to iron out the differences and make up. God doesn't want his children holding grudges. And oh yes, Syzukas, since you're right there to help them with those things, do your best with them. These women work for the message hand in hand with Clement and me and with other veterans, they worked very hard, as hard as any of us. And remember their names are also in the book of life. So celebrate God every day, all day. And I mean revel in Him. Make it as clear as you can to all who meet Him that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the Master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. 
So don't worry, don't fret. Instead of worrying and pray, let your petitions and praises shape your worries and prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your lives. So summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on what's true, what's noble, what's reputable, what's authentic, what's compelling, what's gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. So put it into practice. What you've learned from me, what you've heard and saw and realized, do that. And God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. And I'm glad in God far happier than you'll ever guess. Happy that you'll again show, showing your such strong concern for me. Not that I ever quit praying or thanking, not that you ever quit thanking or praying for me. You just had no chance to show it. And actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned to be now quite content, whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as I am much, and with much as little. I have found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, whatever I am, whatever I make it through, anything in the one who makes me who I am. I don't mean that your help doesn't mean a lot to me. It did. It was a beautiful thing that you came alongside me in my troubles. But you Philippians well know, and you can be sure I'll never forget it, that when I first left Macedonia, Providence, venturing out in the message, not one church helped out in a give and take of this work except you. You were the only one. And even while I was in Thessalonica, you helped out. And not once, but twice. Not that I'm looking for handouts, but I do want you to experience the blessing that issues from generosity. And now I have it all. And it keeps, it keeps getting more. The gifts you sent with Epaphroditus were more than enough, like a sweet-smelling fragrance roasting on the altar, filling the air with fragrance, pleasing God to no end. And you can be sure that God will take care of everything you need, his generosity, exceeding even yours and the glory that pours from Jesus. Our God and Father abounds in glory and just pours out to eternity, yes. Give our regards to every follower of Jesus you meet. Our friends here say hello. All the Christians here, especially the believers who work in the palace of Caesar, want to be remembered to you. Receive and experience this amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, and keep it deep, deep within yourselves. May the Lord add his blessing for the reading of his word tonight. God, we thank you for our time together. And we just posture ourselves right now as those who are submitting to your word. So I pray that you would raise, raise up studiers, students. We are your disciples. Your spirit is here to teach us and he's gonna be here week after week. You're gonna be faithful. Your attendance is going to be perfect, Holy Spirit. Your teaching credibility will be here every week. Regardless of who's teaching, you're going to work and shape our hearts. So we submit ourselves to you. I thank you for each one here. I pray you'd stir a hunger, a passion for your word. We'd begin asking questions. And that spirit, you would begin directing us and showing us answers. So we, we uh, offer ourselves as instruments of yours and your kingdom. And I thank you for each one here. Bless each one here. It's in your mighty and powerful name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Went a little long. Forgive me for that. Uh, but the Lord bless you all. Thank you for so much for coming. Again, read, read what I just read uh, in a uh, version of the Bible and then listen to it again. Okay. Listen to it again, and it's going to help us. It's going to help us tremendously in our time next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to start diving into the scripture and, and laying some things out that I think would just be a, a real gift to you. I'm excited. So Lord bless you guys. Have a great night, and thanks for being here.